here's our here's our agenda. We are going to do an overview of the environmental approach and environmental strategies. And I recognize in all probability that many of you are familiar with this environmental framework. But in the interest of having everybody has to have the same sort of baseline and same um, conceptual approach, we're going to go through that. We're going to talk about this notion of problem environments, because as you'll see when we get into the environmental strategies discussion, we really shift our work, the work of our coalition from um, educating and, and talking and targeting changes in individuals to changes in actual specific settings and environments, and we'll talk more about that. I am going to go through very quickly um, what we consider to be the policy campaign steps, that the, the work that is necessary to move from an idea of a policy to actual enforcement and implementation of a policy. And while we won't spend a lot of time around a specific policy itself, I do want to kind of give you an overview of the steps that are necessary to do that kind of work. And, and then we will cover and talk a little bit about the difference between advocacy and lobbying, which is a, a very hot topic these days. And um, when we get to that, I'll, I'll tell you some interesting things that are breaking on the national front as it relates to this issue. So that's our agenda, four core areas um, that reinforce each other, but nonetheless will require you know, a fair number of uh, slides to, to get through. But let's start first with a poll. And um, it's always helpful for me to have a general sense of where you are as it relates to this notion of environmental approaches and strategies. And when I say familiar, what I mean by that here is more familiar at the implementation level as opposed to having perhaps been to a training uh, or a CADCA um, you know, presentation at the annual forum or something along those lines, but more the actual work of doing environmental strategy. So if you wouldn't mind go ahead, going ahead and um, answering the poll, responding to the poll, that would be very helpful. <clears throat> Okay, so it looks like 70% of you are kind of familiar and 25% are very familiar, 24%, which is great, and 5% of you may not have as, as much background and knowledge. All right, well, that's, that's helpful for me to know. So <clears throat> as we go through the approach, for those of you who are kind of familiar, perhaps those of you who are not as familiar, um, I do want to encourage you to uh, continue to ask questions or, or ask questions and um, uh, go ahead and dig into that a little bit more deeply so that we can um, more fully explore it together. All right, let's go to the next slide. So let's begin with the overarching framework of the public health model. And environmental strategies are ground in the public health approach. The, the work, the environmental strategies really came around in, in, serious, in, Cal in the United States seriously. Um, being looked at in the mid-1980s. For that, they've been around for years and years, and the research was accumulating from the early 70s in the Scandinavian countries where the initial work was done. Uh, but as far as how we in this country took it on, it was really the mid-80s. So frankly, that's not a long time for a prevention discipline to gather a reasonable body of knowledge about what works and what doesn't work. So we're still learning a lot, but we take our cues and have taken our cues from the public health field. And in this model, um, we talk about the interaction of all three of these pieces, the agent being the, the, the substance itself, alcohol, marijuana, uh, Oxycontin, whatever it may be, the host being the individual, and the environment really being where the individual and the agent come together. So um, when you're thinking about environments, then we're looking uh, at places of high risk in communities where substance use, alcohol, or drug use may be occurring. So that's why we focus on home parties. That may be why we focus on the number of alcohol outlets in the downtown or in the community as a whole. We're really looking at what can we do to reduce the risk in specific environments that may um, contribute to and structure behavior so that drinking or other drug use occurs. So many of you who may be familiar with tobacco are, are um, um, perhaps have some background in this public health approach. Tobacco has been using the public health approach for years. And that's largely because the tobacco field is, um, is, resides, the, sort of, the federal focus on tobacco resides in the Centers for Disease Control, which is the nation's public health um, agency. And 
uh, alcohol and tobacco resides in SAMHSA. And so, and while SAMHSA may include public health as part of their framework, it's not the foundation the way it is with CDC. So tobacco has always been about secondhand smoke policies, um, you know, reducing availability of tobacco, looking at ways to create safer environments around secondhand smoke, these kinds of things, and, and have really focused very heavily on that model. We, in a sense, are catching up in that regard. And not only are we catching up as it relates to alcohol in terms of our literature and our body of knowledge, we're also now having to catch up as it relates to the um, growing trend towards legalization of marijuana. And I'll say a little bit more about that when we move into a later stage of the, the actual PowerPoint. So we're in the public health model. And it sometimes helps to think about an environment in a very sort of basic way. Um, this obviously is a picture of a party, a home party. And um, oh, I see a question up here. OK, that wasn't for me. So this, I'm sorry, this environment is a home party. And if you look at this closely, there's some really interesting cues about what may or may not be happening at this particular party. So for example, when you look at the table, there are um, a number of bottles of wine on the table, one, two, three, four, five. People are drinking, you know, they have beer, glasses of beer, glasses of wine in their hand. And from the environmental perspective, at a very kind of micro level, we would say, what can we do in this particular environment to either enhance um, health and safety and reduce risk, the risk associated with the consuming of alcohol. And if you figure this scene or a scene like this spread across your community every Friday and Saturday night where there's lots of parties going on, you can see how this cumulative risk um, and what happens at all of these parties could have an impact on a number of the uh, rates of problems that are traditionally associated with alcohol, such as drinking and driving, such as uh, domestic violence, sexual abuse, violence, fights, all kinds of things can either be enhanced or decreased based on how alcohol is made available in this particular setting. So for example, if this, the host of this party decided that, yes, they were going to serve wine, but they were going to keep wine off the table and just pour wine and ask people if they'd like to have another glass. That's a very different kind of serving practice than they just put it on and that people can reach over and pour it, the equivalent of a host in the host bar, for example. Um, it may be that the, that the family, the hosts here decide that they're going to really emphasize the availability of non-alcoholic beverages and put Perrier water or put you know, tap water on the table and make alcohol available, but only upon request. That's going to dramatically change the consumption rates at this party as well. So how the availability is structured in this one party at this one space in this one space and time has a lot to do with the rates of problems that could both occur with the people at the party and then potentially with people in the community once they leave the party. And the decisions about how to structure the availability and the serving of alcohol or whether to serve or not to serve all those kinds of issues are policy decisions. And they're policy decisions that are made at the family level. Um, but they're policy decisions nonetheless, and I imagine all of you at some point in time have sort of had the discussion in your family, we have kids, are we going to serve alcohol, are we not going to serve alcohol, if we're going to serve it, how are we going to do it, if we go away on, for the weekend, are we going to lock it up, all of these kinds of questions are your, sort of your family policy decisions. And there's power in that, there's power in having the policy that the family decides shape the consumption rates and the behavior at this particular party and then at multiple parties. Public health, a public health approach in a sense dictates that you have to move the rates of problems across the community or the state or the country, whatever your target area is. And so getting to one party and affecting one home may, it's certainly not going to be enough to really reduce rates of problems related to alcohol or other drugs in your community. But getting to all homes and having all homes adopt a policy like this could. And so when we start talking about strategies later, you'll see that the strategies we're suggesting and the strategies which have evidence to them are those which have the capacity to reach lots of people in the community. All right, so that's kind of a, a, a preliminary hit at this whole notion of, of uh, sort of what's an environment. And this is an environment as well. Um, you know, it's a fraternity party. And we don't need to talk a lot about what happens here. And, and even now, uh, across the country, um, with the incredibly high binge drinking rates that are occurring at universities, 
college campuses are struggling with how to structure the alcohol consumption and availability both on campus at uh, fraternity sororities in their own pubs, um, at special events, as well as thinking collaboratively with the surrounding community about how to address the availability in the form of on-sale, off-sale premise, uh, alcohol outlets, and those kinds of things. So again, lots that we need to be thinking about in terms of environments. And environments can move from small settings to your entire community. So let me just stop um, for a moment and ask if anybody has any questions so far. We're on slide six. We're really moving along. <laughs> but are there any questions about this whole framework about you know, what constitutes an environment? And I'm sort of looking at the question box to see if anybody wants to type anything in. All right, let's keep moving in. <clears throat> so we are now developing a pretty robust um, science around alcohol and less so around other drugs, but still around alcohol we know a fair amount. <clears throat> and core to the science is this notion of availability as being a, a risk factor. And what we see as early as the 80s and increasingly borne out in the science till, till now, is that as you increase availability of alcohol in, your, in that party, in your community, in the state, for example, through uh, privatizing uh, alcohol control stores, um, you see increased alcohol consumption. So it's a pretty straight line relationship. The more there is, the more people consume it. There's obviously mitigating factors, but generally speaking, this relationship holds that as you increase the availability, you see increases in per capita consumption um, across your community, across the state, across the country. And as you increase consumption, you increase alcohol-related problems. Now, embedded in this, in this science is the notion that alcohol problems, as we understand them, I'm sorry, I, I keep hitting my spacebar by accident. Um, alcohol problems are not just do not just occur with those who have serious alcohol problems, either alcoholic or alcohol dependent, uh, based on a clinical diagnosis, or you know um, may have been in, in treatment and drinking again. The, the it's true that 20% of the drink, people drink 80% of the alcohol, but those 20% of the people who are drinking 80% of the alcohol, only a small percentage of them, relatively speaking, are have are chemically dependent, or, you know, are alcohol dependent. So the range of problems that occur in our country aren't just caused by those who have drinking problems. And you, I'm sure you all know that, but it bears witness, and it's important to say that, because it's not surprising to see um, other approaches, sometimes supported by the alcohol industry, sometimes it's supported by different groups, saying, well, if you just deal with the alcoholic, then you, you know your alcohol problems are going to go away in, in your community or certainly go down dramatically in your community. But the science just doesn't, it just doesn't support that. So what do we know about what works? And there really are two critical pieces to guides to help us move forward with understanding best practice in this country as a, and, and really that internationally. In this country, there are two key sources. The book on the left, Alcohol, No Ordinary Commodity, uh, which is available through Oxford Press. And you can see the long list of, um, of authors at the bottom. The lead author is Tom Baber, B-A-B-O-R. And this is a very dense but a very important uh, source book because what he's done, they have done, what the authors have done, <clears throat> excuse me, has gone through and looked at all the major research and summarized it and gone and created a topology which allows us to see what has more effectiveness and what has less effectiveness. And it goes through in significant detail and provides the evidence base behind that. The Center for uh, the CDC Guide for Community Service Prevention Services, uh, also known as the Community Guide, and you can find that online at the Community Guide, also has done a similar thing where they have taken, they bring together panels of experts and they look at specific issues like um, alcohol outlet density, like um, um, responsible beverage service, alcohol taxes, strategies we're familiar with, and they have gone through and looked at all of the science and they determine whether or not they can maintain that a particular strategy has enough science behind it to be able to say that it has an evidence base um, where you can predict certain outcomes. So these two places are a place to go. And I'm not saying it's, it's certainly the community guide is more user-friendly. It's web-based. You go on, you pull this stuff down, you can look at it. Um, 
we're developing action guides around three of these strategies, alcohol and identity, taxes, and this thing called dram shop liability. The alcohol identity one is completed. Um, and so we're trying to translate those evidence-based, at least some of the evidence-based strategies into how-to guides. Um, but alcohol, no ordinary commodity, while it's important, is a deeper, kind of uh, more systematic uh, book that really lays out the science behind this. And here are the areas that it covers education and persuasion, treatment and early intervention, and so on, all the way down. And um, some of these strategies are, are more powerful than others. Some are found to have no evidence or insufficient evidence. Some are found to be ineffective. So I think it's important for you to look at this. The, and not all of these, obviously, are environmental. Education and persuasion is not an environmental strategy. Treatment and early intervention is not an environmental strategy. The, critical element around this is as you look at these things, they're measuring their effectiveness in the context of a population level approach. So while there are clearly educational programs that change behavior, school-based, you know, the ability to reach enough people through that particular strategy to have a change in the broad community environment is challenged. So take a look at this, see what it points out, read it, um, and, and recognize that much of what I'm talking about today really is coming out of the science around alcohol and the ordinary commodity and the, the community guide. Now, when we talk about other drugs, we are seeing the same thing, um, not surprisingly, that as you increase the availability of other uh, drugs, such as marijuana, you're seeing increased consumption. And as you increase consumption, you're seeing increased um, uh, problems. Now, the, the increased consumption of marijuana and the problems that result look different than the increased um, availability of methamphetamine. So, you, while you can't see, you can't claim the same kinds of problems uh, based on specific drugs. You can see, though, increased related problems related to the uh, um, the consumption increases as they take place. So, the book that assists you in understanding what's evidence around that is drug policy in the public good. Well, it's again available from Oxford Press. And in many respects, many of the same authors related to the drug policy. Now you'll see if you look at these two books side by side that we know far less about drug policy than we do about alcohol policy. There just is not the robust science unless you include tobacco in the drug side, in which case we've got tremendous science. But as it relates to um, prescription drugs, marijuana, um, cocaine, and, and so on, we know less about what works at the community level in particular than we do about alcohol. And largely that's because the majority of the money over the last 30 years to address drugs has gone into drug interdiction at this international level. And this book uh, in the science suggests that, that has not been a particularly effective strategy. So we're just now beginning to reprioritize how we think about addressing, say, marijuana dispensaries in our community. What do we do about that? Or the proliferation of pain clinics and where OxyContin is being made. How do we address that? And we're now turning to the science in alcohol and tobacco to inform uh, what we do. So that's a little bit of background on the foundation for what we know and the for foundation for what we recommend uh, as it relates to best practice around environmental strategies. It really does come from these primary sources and it comes from the practice in communities. And the one thing we do know is that community practice is always ahead of research. And, and a, a case in point is we have been doing social host ordinances, they used to be called team party ordinances, since, since the early mid-90s, attempting to address this issue of team parties and homes. And while the ordinances have changed and what we know about them has changed and the writing of them has gone from primarily criminal to civil so that they can be more easily enforced, there's still no evidence in the literature of, in a peer-reviewed sense on the effectiveness of social host ordinances. And so while everybody says they're at best practice, the only reason we think they're best practice is because it ties back to that original framework about availability, consumption, and problems, thinking that we can reduce the availability of alcohol in party settings and we have a greater chance of reducing consumption in them, and therefore fewer problems occur in your community. And if you take that across all parties in your community in a year, then you have a chance of actually knocking down some of the numbers relates to the harms associated with binge drinking in party settings. But we don't know that for sure. There's a um, current 
uh, uh, federal study out of Wake Forest now uh, that we're working on to look at the five-year project, to look at the effects of social hosts. But we won't be able to really report the results of that for, for perhaps four years. So let's, let's translate, transition now sorry, into the details about environmental approaches. And again, stop me with questions. Stop me with uh, whatever, um, if anything I'm saying is I'm moving too fast or if you have questions about this. Um, the first and probably one of the most important issues here is that environmental strategies and individual strategies are not in competition with one another. They shouldn't be, and I think the only thing that puts them in competition with one another is the fact that we have, we have um, diminished resources to do prevention in this country. Some places we have more, some places we have less, less but overall we have far less, um, far fewer resources than what we need to prevent the kinds of problems we're seeing and the cost of these problems. So the work that's being done in communities and schools, the work that's being done um, in, in trying to do educational efforts at the community level are critically important. By themselves, they're not enough to change rates of problems. That is clear. And I think you probably know that. And certainly that's what the science has been saying now for 10 years um, and continues to, to, to say that. And you'll see that in the um, alcohol and the ordinary commodity. Um, but environmental strategies does require a kind of shift in how we think about doing the work of coalitions and how we think about doing the work um, of, of organizations and agencies. And when we think about individual strategies, the core principles here are that alcohol problems or alcohol and other drug problems really are problems of individuals, that they reside in the individual. Maybe it's the DNA, maybe it's the um, psychological makeup, maybe it's the the um, ways in which that person has been socialized, whatever, the messages they've received as a person, as a, as a, as a child, whatever it is, it keeps the, it keeps the interaction between the, the uh, coalition and the agency uh, focused on individuals. So we have parenting classes, we have school-based education, we have different kinds of training, so on and so forth. Um, and it presumes that there's a fundamental lack of information out there about um, substances that if we could fill in those gaps and provide enough of it and shift how we deliver it, talk more about the negative consequences, you know, because there appears to be a lack of negative consequences, um, if we could increase more about the normative environment, if we could just somehow build people's resistance and their skill sets, then we could in fact change individuals and they can make the right decisions about their personal relationship with substances. And while there is some evidence to show that very deep comprehensive programs that focus on skills building and resistance training coupled with strong environmental approaches at the, at the, at the community level can have impacts, significant impacts. Focusing on these areas alone um, is a necessary but not sufficient approach to prevention. And so we built the complementary piece, and, and that's the word complementary I think is critical, but it does, the complementary piece is quite different. So instead of focusing on strategies that try and address the, the gaps that I just presented on this previous slide, we focus on a very different area. We target the social, physical, and public environments where sales and use occur. So suddenly we're shifting from thinking about what are these individuals doing to how are these environments structured? Are they structured in such a way that they can potentially reduce consumption and therefore uh, rates of problems, or are they structured in such a way that they encourage it? And as we get into the four Ps, we'll talk more about that. But our targets become the broader public environment. We look at alcohol and other drug problems as not just about addiction or individual dependency, but as a collective reflection of the, the norms and the practices in the community. Um, we Our targets move from the individuals who are the individual consumers of substances to policymakers who have the authority and the ability to change those public environments that we discussed in the first bullet on this particular slide. So if we go back to the original slide of the home party, the target of the home party is the parent, or the host, I'm sorry, the person who has, who's hosting the party. In the fraternity house, it's probably, it's either the fraternity um, uh, officers, or it may bump all the way up to the university 
to set policies about what happens in those particular parties, or it may bump all the way up to the national affiliation of that fraternity, the head of Phi Delta Kappa, you know, Phi Delta Theta, whatever it may be. Um, but again, we work to change the willingness of policymakers to structure environments in safe ways. And so to do that, we seek to change the physical, legal, economic, and social processes in communities. And here, here is the critical, really, distinction, is that we move our job shifts when you do environmental strategies from educating to organizing. And that's probably the most important um, distinction that I at least want to put out at this point in, in the in the webinar is that we our jobs change from doing programming in schools and nonprofits, generally speaking, to really thinking about how do we change the uh, price of alcohol in our community? How do we reduce the number of alcohol outlets? How do we hold adults accountable for hosting and serving? You know, what do we have to do legally to do this? You know, what are the economics? How do we shift the broader community norms around uh, alcohol or other substances in our community? And that's then complemented with the work that's going on at the individual level, in a sense comprises a comprehensive approach to reducing these problems at the community level. So those are the two, those are the distinctions. We really shift our, our focus. And when we shift our focus to these kinds of things, physical, you know, economic, and social processes in communities, our coalition shifts. It has to shift because the people who are who need to do the work to change these processes may not be the same people who have been on your coalition for years who want to do programming. And so you have to either add new people who are policy focused, who want to go out and do community organizing, who really are about building a base of power, because it takes power to change the legal structure, it takes power to change the availability structure in the community, it takes power to target decision makers to do the right thing. Um, you may need to rethink and revisit your membership to bring in um, the kind of folks who kind of who who really want to focus on these particular areas. All right, so this is an important and interesting slide, and it could be a, a training in and of itself. It it is it's from CDC. Tom Friedman is the uh, director of the CDC, and uh, he has created this this pyramid of action in action. And if we look at the pyramid from the base of the pyramid to the top of the pyramid, these are the strategies from bottom, the most powerful, to the top, least powerful, in terms of changing rates of problems at the population level. So I want to start at the top. The notion of alcohol education counseling, ESPER, which is you know, uh, brief intervention, ESPER has a, a very good literature base uh, related to its efficacy as it relates to adults, less so around uh, young people. And so we know that if you do ESPER and you do it well, you can move increasing numbers of people. You can, you can catch people earlier and earlier and earlier in their use cycle and both prevent further um, um, uh, rates of alcoholism or drug dependence and you can arrest those who may already be in that, um, you know, already dependent. The problem with ESPER is not the efficacy of the intervention. It's to get it out to everybody in the community to make a big enough difference. So if you could do ESPER in all clinics, in all hospitals, in all nurses, schools, you know, nurse, uh, nurses at schools, at universities, if you could just get it everywhere, so the people were doing these 30-second interventions, we would move this ESPER down on this, uh, uh, pyramid, but we can't. It's we, you know, just for a variety of reasons, it's difficult. So when you look at the bottom of this, then the most powerful tools we have to to decrease consumption and and increase health are these what we call social determinants: reducing poverty, increasing education to those across the country, employment opportunities. There's a lot that fits in this, but these particular these particular strategies in the lowest um, part of the pyramid are not really achievable. Uh, in, a, in a significant way at the community level. These are national strategies, increasing minimum uh, minimum wages, um, ensuring health care. These kinds of things would make huge differences. Increasing poverty, or decreasing poverty, increasing wealth in individuals will have tremendous impacts 
on the health of our country. Not something we, as a coalition, have a lot of control over. We need to move into the next rung up, removing dangerous products, alcohol energy drinks, which are AEDs, increasing excise taxes, reducing alcohol, that's restricting alcohol marketing, so on. That's where we have power. That's, this is where the world of environmental strategies lives, right in this second from the bottom rung. And then we move up, up the ladder. Now, what's interesting about this framework is that those strategies that have the largest impact also require the most political will to get done. So changing the political, social, economic structures in a community to reduce dangerous products, to increase taxes, and so on, things you see in this uh, uh, second rung of the pyramid, require public will and political will, require push. And in order to generate this political will, you need to have a strong coalition who can, who can have enough gravitas in the community that when it begins to work on these strategies, decision makers have to pay attention and recognize that this is a voice that needs to be heard and it's important to, um, uh, to pay attention and because it reflects the, the general will of the community, not just a few folks. So that's a foundational piece. So to do stuff that works at the environmental level, you need to have a strong, powerful coalition who decision makers will pay attention to. So I'm going to stop for a moment um, before I go into the next piece of the presentation, which is what we call the four Ps, and just give you a moment to see if there's any questions at all or any disagreements or anything, um, As because I've been rambling now for 45 minutes almost without taking a breath, and just want to see if you all if this is making any sense to you. So um, maybe what we could do here, Allison, just as a, a quick check-in, is if we could ask people to um, maybe raise their hands if, if, they're, um, if this is making sense at this point. Absolutely. Uh, okay. And it looks like we do have a couple people who did raise their hand uh, that may want to make a comment. So would you like me to just unmute? everybody and you call on someone or just sure them sure yeah go ahead and unmute everybody we'll see if we get it you know the sound of a uh, hang on a second because it's not letting me do that I thought there was a way to do that very quickly hold on one sec please pause for a moment of tech it uh, looks like we're going to have to do one at a time. I'm sorry. Oh, um, is someone unmuted now? Um, no, but I can. Uh, I'll go ahead and let's. Uh, I'll call on Beth. And Beth Thomas, you are unmuted. Um, you can make your comment or question. I unfortunately don't have one at the time. Thank you, though. Oh, okay. Yeah, did she, she was raising her hand to say it made sense. <laughs> oh, okay, great. <laughs> I'm going to okay. do a quick thing here, I think, and, and clear all the raised okay, hands and, and re-raise your hand if you have an actual comment or question. Yeah, that would be great. <clears throat> so, uh, and I will say that I would like to make a comment, and then um, it looks like someone has, uh, as soon as I'm done with my comment, Sheila's asked if we could define expert in the questions box, so you can take it on that, Michael. I just want to sure. uh, point out that I, I think there was a, a big aha moment in what you just said on this slide, which I love this slide, by the way. Um, I think that third box piece and talking about the impact and the political will, but also the public will, that sometimes we in coalitions get so caught up in, in the to-do and the tasks and, and following our logic model, our strategic plan, and we don't think of capacity in quite that way, that what is our capacity to move both the public and the political will so that we've got more power to get things changed and done on a grander scale in our community. And that's really going up a different level of thinking than when we're hunkered down just doing the work. But I think sometimes we forget about that, that that's the value and power of coalition, is to move public and political will. So that was very powerful to me. Yeah, thank you. I, that's, a, that's a great comment. And, and, you know, we all work with our own coalitions or other coalitions, and um, I have the good fortune to sort of interact with lots of coalitions across the country through my training. And it's been really interesting for me over the last few years to pay attention to what, 
what blocks or inhibits coalitions from moving to implement these strategies. And it's not, at some level, it's not really a lack of will. Because, you know, we'll meet, we'll talk, and people will develop action plans to do a particular policy. And, um, you know, I'll check back in with them in a month, and nothing will have happened. And, and I'll say, well, gosh, you know, what, how come? You had this great action plan. You know, we, we just laid this stuff out so clearly. What you're going to do, school ad, well, went back, and I had comment to do, and I had to, you know, my coalition wanted me to go into the schools and do this, and they wanted me to do that. And before you knew it, a month had gone by, and I hadn't been able to go out and talk to one person about, you know, moving this policy forward or whatever was on the action plan. And so part of it, it seems to me, is this, this all-encompassing um, tendency for this work this, the, the work that we've been doing, which really focuses less on this kind of policy stuff and, and environmental stuff and more on the other kinds of strategies that we've learned, um, can, can, can pull us away from. It's almost a rubber band. You kind of snap the rubber band out, and we're going to go do this new work, and the next thing you know, you're back into doing the exact same things. Or coalitions get hit with um, their membership going, you want to do what? <laughs> you know, not a, no, we're not going to do that. That's way too controversial. You want to you want to stop the proliferation of alcohol outlets in our community? Are you crazy? No, 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 no. That'll piss everybody off. No, we don't want to do that. So, so there is this really interesting piece about that I think you talked about, which is the um, when you were talking when you were mentioning that, Allison, is that sort of that default place that we live and. And until, and so the, the structural piece that has to happen, and I, I, this is a broad generalization, it may not hold for everybody, it, but it seems to work in those coalitions that I coach, is that if you want to do this work, you have to sort of, you have to make a hard and fast distinction that X percent of my time, depending on what it is you're going to do, is going to be just this work. And you carve it out, and you hold it, you know, tight, and you don't let it get pulled into the other stuff that coalitions can demand from you. And that means other stuff begins to fall off in all probability. But um, that's what it takes. It takes a really conscious effort to move your role from doing whatever it is you're doing to, to doing something different. And so for those of you who are doing some policy work, it's going to be interesting, and we'll talk about this, I think, in the second webinar a lot. Um, what is it that's, what are the barriers and the challenges that you may have for those of you who have already started? So yes. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Great. And Wasn't then I just word? want to direct this back to Sheila, who had the question because she's not familiar with the term expert. Yes. Thank you. Um, so expert stands for Strategic Brief um, Intervention Referral to Treatment. And what it means is it's a evidence-based intervention usually done by a doctor or a clinician of some sort. So a good example of this is a um, a student at a university is, gets an MIP, you know, minor in possession of alcohol, and is referred to student health to go to alcohol classes, you know, as punishment. <laughs> There's no other way to put it. And he gets to the student health center, and he sits down to enroll in, in the class. And the person who's enrolling him or her says, does a 30-second does to one minute, very subtle, very quick series of questions. So, is this the first time you've had this happen to you? Do you drink a lot? I mean, there's a, certain, there's a protocol. And in that short 30-second to two-minute interaction, if done correctly, there's enough information that's transmitted so that person knows where this person is on the risk scale and whether a, a, a referral needs to be made into some counseling or some other service. So that's what expert is. Um, there's obviously way more to it, but uh, in a nutshell, it's that very brief, very strategic, quick intervention with the person, as opposed to just signing them up and sending them off to alcohol edu. Nope, nope, we're going to do this, and and um, that can be very, very powerful. And, and Michael, if I can uh, make a tie-in to that here in Ohio, sure. change is happening, especially kind of foreshadowing the healthcare changes in the medical health home. Um, that there is a strong role for preventionists that we can do experts under problem identification and referral is one of the CSAP six strategies, and that we are really looking at a state level at how do we start to work with um, different medical associations and uh, medical health home leaders to, to start to play with that and how we as preventionists can start to sell that service. Um, a lot of the expert trainings have been targeted only to treatment providers and counselors. Right. 
Akron, Ohio, and, and a lot of prevention folks aren't putting this on their radar. From the coalition point of view, I think this is that place where part of the coalition's job is, is also systems change and, and making sure there's access and, and that the needed services are where they need to be. And there, there's a real role for coalitions to help advocate for ensuring efforts happening in more places. And there is a role for prevention to do that and get funded to do that. Yeah, I think you made a really important point, which is it doesn't mean your coalition has to do the effort. It just means that your role is to advocate for it and ensure that it happens at the community since it is an evidence base. Absolutely. Really, really and important. Key, and key places of intervention where, you know, it, it's taken to people where they're at. So it looks like we have no more questions, so it looks like we're ready to roll. All right. So let's move into the, we're on, we're on slide 16, um, into the next, the, the next piece of this. And this is really introducing the the four P's and the four P's are of product promotion price in place and these are considered community risk factors now if you've looked at the risk factor literature um, you know you may see evidence of some of these in that framework but most of the work that's been done around risk factor have been mostly looking at individual risk factors and the community risk factors have um, not in type, not in this type of typology as perhaps CTC or some of the other fra you know um, frameworks look at, but but the science is very clear about the fact that these are significant risk factors in terms of uh, uh, contributing to rates of consumption and rates of excessive drinking. And I would argue, although again we have less, we have some knowledge about this for other drugs, certainly for other drugs as well. So what I'd like to do now is kind of walk you through these these risk factors because. The risk factors play out differently depending on what kind of, what kind of community you live in, where you live, and and part of your part of the homework, and you know you probably think who's this guy to give me homework, but part of the homework is to have you begin to think about this for your own community, and we call these local conditions. It's like what does this risk factor, product promotion place by uh, price, look like in your own community? So the next series of slides are just a quick what we might call community tour as it relates to each of these four P's. So let's start with product, the P of product. When we're talking about product, what we're really talking about are what kind of high-risk beverages do you have in your community and where are they sold? And so you'll see frequently when we talk about one of the P's, the P's don't operate in isolation from one another. You know, you've got to sell the, pri the product somewhere, and so that gets you into place, and you've got to sell it for some price, and that gets you into the price piece, you know, it costs something. But just the actual availability of these particular products can be risky in communities. And so we look at some of these new alcohol pops, things like Cisco. Cisco, um, you may be familiar with it. Cisco has a street name of liquid crack, you know, back when crack was the drug du jour. Um, because at the time, I was able to buy, and this was in the late 90s, it's still around. I still see it in stores all over the place. It just doesn't have quite the same. And I'll show you a slide. In a moment, I'll show you a slide right now. Um, this is what Cisco looks like. These products, in this picture and the previous picture, um, are high alcohol content, sweet tasting beverages. So Cisco has the equivalent of five shots of distilled, distilled spirits in them, and you can sell for less than two bucks. And because they're lightly carbonated, young people get them. You get you get essentially five drunk, five drinks for two bucks, and you drink it down quickly. Same with MD2020 on the right, lower right-hand side. That used to be called Mad Dog. Mad Dog 2020 used to be the indigent street drink. Used to be the stuff that only the um, you know down and out who are living in an urban environment would drink because it would be cheap and it'd be available only in an inner-city liquor, inner liquor store. Now this stuff is available everywhere. Up in our upper left-hand corner, 40-ounce malt liquors. You know, four drinks uh, in a, in a bottle, cheap. Um, and of course, Night Train and Thunderbird are sort of the classics that we're familiar with. So these products are high content, very high risk beverages. And not only does the alcohol content concern us, but the way that they're flavored, the way that they're marketed um, as a, they serve as a transition drink between soft drinks, which have no alcohol, and you know, straight uh, uh, alcoholic beer or uh, distilled spirits or whatever it may be, uh, like a bridge. They're a bridge, a bridge drink. It makes it easier to get into the drinking um, 
uh, into drinking, starting to drink at, without having the pain and suffering of having to drink, you know, beer, which basically doesn't taste good uh, at first go. And so we're very concerned about these. And it's interesting to look at the, tr the, the trend rates around the use of these alcohol, um, these alcohol pops, um, which is a story in and of itself for another time. Um, but alcohol pops, as you may know, are sold as um, a, a malt beverage. So they're sold with beer and wine. They have a high, higher alcohol content. But in fact, the way alcohol pops are produced is they start with a malt uh, uh, alcohol product, a beer, basically. They take all of the alcohol out. They take the flavor out. They add distilled spirits, and they add flavors back in. And so what you get is a distilled spirits beverage that started as a malt beverage. And because it started as a malt beverage, that's how it's taxed. It's able to be sold in places where um, uh, anywhere that a beer is sold and so on and so forth. It's a very, very devious uh, process. And as we've seen, the rates of the use of these flavored drinks go for young girls go up while they've held relatively steady for, for boys. And so it's, it's very, very insidious when we start talking about the availability of these particular products. When we talk about tobacco, obviously, tobacco is diversified for years. And you know, some of the interesting stuff that's moving, on, moving out there now more and more is this whole thing around hookah. And, and hookah bars and the use of hookah that somehow doesn't fall under secondhand smoke laws and you know these kinds of things. So again, the diversification of tobacco products, some of which, because they're new and always innovating, are not showing up um, in the federal laws around, that were constructed under the master settlement agreement. So they don't fall under having to be placed behind counters necessarily. And you really have to begin to look at these as local strategies to begin to reduce the availability and the access to these particular pieces. For example, cigars you know, don't fall under the same restrictions as do cigarettes. So we need to be paying attention to tobacco laws. Pharmaceuticals, you know, the, the whole pharmaceutical thing is such a debacle. And the way in which it's played out, um, you know, when OxyContin was introduced, it was introduced as a non-addictive drug. You know, it's just a phenomenal we got there. And now they're, the major pharmaceutical companies are in this, in this panic mode around trying to produce these products in ways that can't be chopped up so you can snort them. I forget the name of the drug. Probably someone on the phone knows. It's, I'm blanking on right now that has even more. It's even a more powerful drug with longer effects uh, on the narcotic than, than OxyContin that they're trying to get approval for. And they market. And we'll, you know, we won't spend a lot of time talking about how the pharmaceutical industry markets but the notion of pharmaceuticals used to be, you didn't see it on TV, you didn't see Viagra advertised, you didn't see Cialis advertised, you didn't see all these other you know, um, uh, or, or, uh, prescription drugs advertised on TV, now you do. And I think that's created an environment, a normative thing in our country where pharmaceuticals are considered okay. Marijuana. So marijuana is the big, is the train that's, that's going full stream from west to east across the country. And, um, and with Colorado and Washington State falling um, into a legal status, uh, you know, my personal opinion is that states, some states will hold out longer and will resist for longer periods of time and may start with decriminalization and then capitulate around medical marijuana and eventually capitulate around legal marijuana. And they'll look different in each state, but I think it's just a matter of time until states increasingly begin to legalize what we're seeing in Colorado and Washington. And, and every day, almost, it looks like another state is, is adopting medical marijuana. And medical marijuana is the camel's nose under the tent. It was from the very beginning. Uh, and we now know that. And so what's happening with marijuana is they are looking increasingly like alcohol and tobacco uh, using these four Ps, which we'll describe. And so getting into that, you can see some of the examples of marijuana. They now are diversifying which kinds of marijuana they have. For anybody who's ever been into a dispensary, it's it's an astounding experience. I mean, you will go up to a counter and you have to pick up 30 different varieties of marijuana. And you can buy brownies and you can buy bud candy and you can see now bud in a bottle and that's not bud beer. You know, this is marijuana soda. So they are diversifying the way that alcohol is diversified and the way tobacco is diversified. They are becoming another retail. We are watching the growth and the initiation of a brand new retail drug industry. And it's fascinating to watch and to, and we are dramatically underpowered and behind the curve around it. Synthetic marijuana, even with 
changes in federal law, we're still seeing this stuff creep back on, been, being reformulated and creeping back into shells. And you know, there's been a number of deaths around this recently, so it, it bears uh, attention in your community. Uh, if it's not in your community now, not being sold in places, it may very well. It, it, because it's gone, um, places that have got rid, thought they got rid of it, it's back. And so it's very toxic, as you know, and, and worth paying attention to. Methamphetamine, um, you know, some communities still have a major problem with it. I live in Maui. Uh, in the my immediate neighborhood, when I'm walking or running, I can smell methamphetamine being smoked not infrequently. We have a big ice problem here in this in this state, but not so much in some of the other places where I've worked. So let's go into a next poll. In your community, which of the following is a major problem for youth? Um, really, what are you seeing? in your own community um, related to these particular kinds of products, what are young people using the most? Prescription drugs, marijuana, alcohol pops, other. Okay. Interesting. Uh, Marijuana, so it's like a watching a horse race. Um, okay, so I'd be interested in, in uh, it may be uh, marijuana starting to, horse marijuana starting to lead the pack, um, not surprising. I'd be interested in knowing a little bit about the other, maybe that the other is not just alcohol bops, but maybe other kinds of alcohol. Um, so would anybody be willing to um, say a little bit about when who voted other? about what that other looks like, just so I have a, a sense of that. And maybe you could just raise your hand and uh, Allison can unmute you. I would appreciate a little feedback in that regard. Have you who? Sheila. Yeah, Sheila's back muted. Can you hear me? Yep, sure can, hi. Well, hi. Well, I'm seeing with the young people in our community is the alcohol. Um, mm -hmm. They're getting it through other folks, but it's, when, when you go and talk with kids in the high school, the issue is alcohol. Yeah, so it may not be alcohol pops, or it might be, it may be beer, it may be vodka, who knows, right? But at some level, they're, they're drinking, they're primarily drinking. A lot of vodka. I hear about the vodka. Yeah, you know, isn't that interesting about the vodka piece? Because vodka, the vodka manufacturers have made a concerted effort to diversify their product. And you can see it now. You have these infused vodkas where they taste like peach, mm -hmm. they taste like... And, and yeah. so now it's just so much easier to drink vodka than it used to be. And you mix it with Red Bull, and you, you get the equivalent of an alcohol energy, you know, an alcoholic energy drink. Uh, it's pretty astounding. So, okay, good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, you know, yeah, alcohol... Is, I'm sorry, we also had someone type in, uh, Elizabeth, uh, that K2 and Sizzurp, which I have not heard of. What is Sizzurp? I don't know what if Elizabeth is able to speak where she could clarify what Sizzurp is in her, uh, by typing that in. Okay, while she's perhaps typing, we can um, go. So, go so thank Emily. you. Emily's also got her hand up. Oh, great. Emily, you're unmuted. Emily, you are unmuted. Nope, nothing Hi. to share. Hi, Air. Okay, no problem. So I, we now know that, that it is cough syrup with Sprite and a Jolly Rancher. Ah, what? No end to the cough syrup? No end, the, no end to the creativity of young people. So. Um, Interesting. Okay, so K2 and scissor, which so cough syrup. <laughs> All right. Um, so that really does speak to how important it is to try and stay on top of these trends. Um, and I think it's interesting. It's coalitions have a tendency to follow the the sort of new hot kinds of of emerging drug use as it comes out. And and so. Part of our role, of course, is to know which of these substances is being used the most and which of these substances is being used the most in what settings. And then that becomes our target. And while it may be important to get in front of something uh, and certainly do some community education around it, 
um, it may not deserve at this point in time anyway the same level of effort and focus as some other substance that obviously has taken root and is growing you know, dramatically in your community. All right, so let's let's keep moving. Um, let's move into this the notion of promotion now and and talk a little bit. And I, when when we talk about promotion, to understand these four P's in your community, you have to kind of go out into your community. You have to go into liquor stores and convenience stores and walk around and look at ads and windows and look at ads and sides and look and see if you have billboards and see what's on the bus kiosks, all of those things. And you know that's what we call an environmental scan. And you know I'm certainly happy to make available to Allison. She doesn't already have a series of scan instruments that we recommend that allow coalition and coalition members to get deeply familiar with these these kinds of um, these four P's and how they play out in your own community. So obviously a lot of advertising is youth focused and some much of that youth focused advertising um, is not something we can do anything about. It's it's in national media, uh, it is uh, um, uh, in, in magazines that young people read and newspapers that they read. Um, out, Alison, we may want to mute back. There we go. Yeah, I'm not sure where um, that noise came from. Yeah, uh, weird. Okay. So it might be. Uh, okay, I think we're good. Sorry. Good. No problem. Thank you. So, so we got you know the stuff that that in a sense is difficult for us to control, but but it bears you know attention. It, it's worth looking and acknowledging the fact that there's a tremendous that the you know the alcohol industry spends three billion dollars a year promoting its product. $3 billion a year promoting it. That doesn't even get into the, all the other aspects of their work, but that's a tremendous amount of messaging going out into the broad environment that shapes how we think about the use of alcohol. And obviously the majority of it only talks about the rewards of using it, never talks about the consequences. So there's some, there's some advertising and promotion we can do very little about, but there's some we can do more about. And there's a, a growing evidence now to show that Advertisements in windows like this, liquor stores, um, and inside stores where young people go, and when you, when you have it um, you know, proliferating in different settings across the community, have an impact both on when they start drinking and how much they, young people drink when they've already initiated. So we need to start paying attention to advertising in our community. It is a risk factor. It's also blight, frankly. I mean, when you talk to residents who live near places like this, the thing that they complain about is the fact that it just looks so bad, and you know, and they don't want their kids walking by it. They don't want their kids going into the store, and and I'm sure many of you have seen the video called "This Place," which really begins to talk about and and sets the frame for this notion of how our environment in the last 30 years has transformed from one in which there was clear boundaries and clear lines between advertising and promotion and product and price and all these places, and how those have kind of morphed into one this one and young people now who are growing up in that never knew any different. And so they're used to seeing these signs. They're used to seeing this. And just because they're used to it doesn't mean it doesn't influence them. And so that's an important consideration for us. So going out and looking in your own communities about, you know, in your grocery stores, in your in your CVSs, your Walgreens, your major Rite Aids, you know, where's the advertising? Where are the end caps? What do young people see when they walk in? What's next to those products? Um, you know, what does it look like? Uh, so that's important, but there's there's an insidious and growing shift in how the alcohol industry is marketing now, and they are dramatically moving their advertising revenue into social marketing and social media. And so this is a longer story, but there are voluntary uh, guidelines for both distil for distilled spirits, brewers, and wineries and wine companies, um, vintners, and they're supposed to regulate what what's in ads, when it's placed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so on their Facebook pages, we find that all of those guidelines are just basically thrown to the wind. And this is a, this will be a completely illegal um, photograph in a magazine. But it's front and, it can be it was front and center on the Jim Beam Facebook page. And you know part of the problem is it's advertising, you know, essentially an alcoholic an energy drink, alcohol energy drink, uh, Jim Beam and, and Red Bull, and of course the, the tobacco as well. And what's happening in social media around in the biggies are Jim Beam and Smirnoff and, and Captain Morgan, who also advertises on a number of those advertised on TV now and the cable stations, um, is that they, when you go in and you certify your 21, easy to do, uh, 
you can then get into their site. And if you like the site, if you click like, they will start sending you personal emails, text messages, whatever vehicle you like. And so you've got a phone, you get a text message, and that text message could say, hey, Michael, just want you to know that Captain Morgan is going to be free tasting of Captain Morgan will be happening at the downtown bar in your community next Saturday night. Hope you can make it. And so they build this personal relationship with individual targeted messages to you about their product and its availability and when there's going to be happy hours for it. And so young people who are underage are getting these messages, but of course adults are getting them as well. And that's completely changing the nature of how people feel about the products and their personal relationship to the product in profoundly, um, um, in profound ways. And so we're very, very concerned about this. Go into Captain Morgan, go into Jim Beam, dig around, explore, and find a new world of, of targeted, targeted marketing to both youth and adults. Um, Echo's promotion has been around a long time. We won't spend time talking on it, about it, but it is important for you all to see what that looks like in your community. Um, this is going to vary from you, for you all. The whole notion of marijuana uh, advertising is more about what's coming than is probably what is in um, Ohio at this point, although I'd be interested in any experiences you all may have with, with this promotional piece. But in the states who have legalized uh, dispensaries, you know, there's been a dramatic surge in billboards, in uh, alternative newspapers advertising, you know, medical marijuana doctors in the back, and and price discounts on, you know, the price, the the, the cheap pot for the week. You know, there's just a series of things that have happened that are uh, really designed. And of course, the internet is still out there, uh, um, advertising both where you can get pot um, uh, and different varieties, which ones work well, which ones don't work so well. So there's, you know, a tremendous amount. But the advertising and the promotion of marijuana has grown in leaps and bounds. And I know that states like Colorado and Washington State are attempting to put the um, sort of horseback in the barn around the promotional stuff. But I, I think it's going to be very, very difficult to do that. And so it's, it's worth kind of keeping your eye on and watching as, as we move in this, in this direction. Um, let's move on. Um, so let's take poll number three now. So when you think about your community, uh, what's the primary form of alcohol promotion that your youth are exposed to? And you may not know at this point, that's fine, um, but just interested in knowing what this looks like. All right, let me open the poll. Ads on the outside of outlets, ads inside of alcohol outlets, promotions of special events, not sure. Interesting. I wonder if the ads inside the outlets, uh, you know, once you start looking for them, they're there. Sometimes they're just, they're just so there that it's difficult to see, but it'd but be interesting to know some more about that. So part of what you're going to see in the homework, and I can sort of signal you this now, and then I am seeing a blinking question, um, is that we're going to be asking you to identify one or two of these four Ps, price, place, product, promotion, and, and do some experimentation and go out and look around and sort of describe what you've got, and, and you'll see the instructions at the end. But I would be thinking now as we walk through this about your own community and, um, you know, what you know, which of these seem to be significant enough risk factors that you may want to ultimately um, consider addressing them. All right, so moving on to the next slide of price. And price is tough, um, frankly. You know, I see, a, let me go to this. Our, uh, our coalition has collaborated to provide expert training six times in the past years really helped to make our coalition. Name. Oh, that's great, good, excellent, good to know. So price. the relationship between price and consumption is almost a straight line relationship. This is some of the earliest research when we began to wake up and go, holy smoke, if you make the price of alcohol cheaper, it goes up. Not only does it go up, it seems to go up the same amount, the price goes down. And so very early on, we recognized that we should be paying very close attention to the risk factor of the price of alcoholic beverages. And of course, the industry knows that as well. The place where the majority of the um, uh, where the policy lever sits around price at, at the state level in terms of the excise tax rates. And 
as you increase the excise taxes, you see that passed on ultimately to the cost of the beverage. There's some things you can do locally, but it is a significant, um, a significant piece, and it is why the industry spends just millions and millions of dollars a year um, trying to defeat excise tax initiatives at the state level. And yet, the research suggests it's probably the most powerful prevention strategy that we have, because the, the when you increase the price of a beverage, you don't have to do anything more. You just have to watch it, watch the consumption rate go down. True for tobacco as well, and we know that from tobacco. There's there comes a point. There's you know there's some important pieces in here to understand around how much can you, how high can you make it before it goes into a black market kind of situation. But but that put that aside for a moment. Um, you can save tremendous number of lives. You can decrease underage drinking. You can delay the age of onset by increasing the price of alcoholic beverages. And at some level, it just makes sense. You know, if you're a kid and you got ten bucks in your pocket, and you're, you know, you're going to get your alcohol, say, from a guy standing outside a liquor store or a convenience store, and you give him ten bucks, he's going to be able to buy you one six pack. If that six pack, you know, because he's going to take three bucks for himself, he's going to buy you a seven dollar, you know. Um, six pack of beer. If that if that can buy two six packs, you can drink twice as much. You can certainly drink more. And similarly, in you know when you think of, a, of an underage party, a team party, how much money goes into the till dictates how much money is going to be spent on alcohol and how much alcohol is going to be in that in that environment. So price is important, and it and the price increases can be relatively minor. Increasing the price of a of a beer or a, a, a what we consider a unit of alcohol, beer, six ounce glass of wine, or shot of alcohol by as much as nickel can decrease consumption rates by three, four percent. So very, very powerful effects, and and the industry understands that, and that's why excise taxes are absolutely held on to with a death grip. Uh, because if you start increasing the price of alcohol, profits are going to decrease. Public health is going to get much better, but profits are going to decrease. And we've seen some interesting things around price. We've seen the fact that the industry is consistently trying to um, normalize the price between alcohol and non-alcoholic beverages, um, and so that it makes it easier to consume alcohol. We've seen things like happy hours, which is where at the local level we find price get coming in, into play. Happy hours are dramatic in terms of the increasing in consumption that occurs during those windows, and and I won't you understand that mechanism. I don't need to explain it. If you go in five bucks and you're gonna have a happy hour, you're gonna drink twice as much. If prices are half, you know, half price. So so. Increasingly, we find communities investing in happy hours and stretching the hours out. Another way we get to prices, we we sell smaller units that cost less. So if you can't afford a fifth and you can't afford a pint, now you can throw an airline bottle of alcohol, and so that you know that two or three dollars can still buy you something from a distilled spirit standpoint. And we know that with legalization and with increased availability, uh, marijuana prices will um, decrease dramatically, and with the decrease, we'll see increased use. So that's a major piece for us to be paying attention to is can you fix price on marijuana? And with and this is part of the rationale for legalizing, quite frankly, is people the states are saying, well, we can we can set the excise tax high enough that it could in fact decrease consumption. And and so part of what we're having to struggle with around that what might appear sound logic is that in in communities, what we're seeing is, at least in the medicinal marijuana communities, is that marijuana is sold in dispensaries so for $30 for an eighth ounce, for example. And but there's so much of the pot grown that it's going out the back door of garages, same quality, same same THC, everything, for half that price. And so the price of the effective street price is 50% of the dispensary price. If you legalize it, is that going to make a difference or not? Who knows? You know, it's, it's, it remains to be seen. And but we are seeing interesting. You know, um, interesting pricing strategies now for marijuana in dispensaries, and I think you know, unless they're banned flat outright in Colorado and Washington State, we inevitably will see these in those states as well. Street prices generally coming down. I think you all know there's a straight, you know, pretty, pretty straight line relationship between the price of oxycontin and the price of heroin. As the price of oxycontin goes up, we see the price of heroin begin to drop. The price of heroin begins to go up. We see oxycontin start to come down. You know, because they're pharmacologically so similar and their effects are so similar, and, and in some respects the distribution mechanisms are so similar. Those two have a in their in a relationship with one another. So this is this is not a poll, but a quick discussion. I guess I'm wondering from you all, and would like to know a little bit about 
if you think of price in your community, um, you know, what's going on? You know, is it, are you, do you have a lot of happy hours? Is the alcohol dirt cheap? Are they selling? Do they have price advertisements coming out in the weekly circulars for a 30 pack for, you know, 12 bucks? Um, and even though marijuana may not be legal, what's happening, and you may not know this either, what's happening to the price of marijuana in your community as, as the availability is probably going up even without the, um, you know, a formal legal structure. So first the alcohol question and then the marijuana question. And if you would raise your hand about either, I'd be interested in hearing a little bit about either of those. Anything from anyone? Amanda Allison, raised Susia. her hand and I've unmuted her. Amanda? Great. Thank you. Hi, Amanda. Hi, Michael. Can you hear me? Yeah, sure can. Okay. Um, in terms of the price risk for um, alcohol, we've approached state legislators and, and mentioned exactly what you just said about mm -hmm. increasing um, alcohol taxes would uh, be one of the biggest um, benefits in decreasing underage drinking and all the other issues associated with that. And in no way did they even want to dialogue yeah. beyond that because of the they, they didn't want to have a tea party with you, yeah. did they? <laughs> yeah, it, that pretty much was a dead issue after that. But their reasoning is is that just the political will is not there at all uh, at any state level. Um, now, mind you, that was at the state level, um, at least mm -hmm. here in Ohio. Um, just due to the budget situation and um, no one wanting to increase um, any kind of taxes in, in this climate coming off, coming out of the recession. Um, and then in terms of the second question, um, marijuana we're just finding with our Pride student drug use data and anecdotally and other um, survey mechanisms that we have is, is that it's just extremely cheap um, yeah. and available. Right. I couldn't say cheap, exactly how much. Um, right, I know that, right. like prescription drugs, I think it's ten dollars a pill. Um, I, but marijuana is um, cheap. Yeah. And so, do you have a sense where the majority of your marijuana is coming from? Um, no, I have a better sense of where uh, heroin is coming from, but I couldn't really say, um, at least from my community coordinator perspective, where the marijuana is coming mm -hmm. from. Where's your heroin coming from? Um, I've heard doctors and law enforcement say Mexican cartels, that there's two mm -hmm. Mexican cartels very active in this community, although we just had a huge DEA bus that is supposedly supposed to chip away at that, but that's what I've been told. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, so it's interesting. The heroin stuff is obviously more complex to manufacture than it is mm -hmm. to grow weed in your backyard. So you, the marijuana stuff, is it's not surprising, and the technology and the ability to grow very high potent, you know, sources of marijuana. It's just so easy now. Um, yeah, it's, it's not surprising. That's, and I think this is what's stimulating to a large extent people saying, you know, it's going to happen anyway, so let's try and get our arms around it through a regulatory structure. And, and it, that's, at some level, that's kind of a difficult thing to argue against. But, but we also know that once you become, once you make it legal, once you make marijuana legal, then the four P's kick in. They kick in in a, in a legal way. And once they kick in in a legal way, then there's constant economic pressure to expand availability, decrease the price, promote the heck out of it, and you know really develop these increasingly unique products like bounties and soft drinks, which you know just basically undermine any kind of core regulatory piece. So, um, the you know the price, the the price piece of, of alcohol, um, I think that's. What, your, what was your comment again about that? Because I, I had a, I had a, a thought on it, and now I've lost it because I started thinking about um, marijuana. It just, um, I can't even give you a price number or range. I just right. know that we, we've been told it's being used more frequently, that the stigma associated with it is, is um, drastically diminished, and that they're right. using it, and it's very accessible to them, and it's, it's fairly cheap. Along, but prescription drugs are fairly cheap too, and heroin, uh, at least in Ohio. Yeah. So I'm not surprised that you couldn't get a lot of movement on the alcohol tax issue at the state level. That's yeah. And the irony, of course, is that it could help the budget. <laughs> we know right. that. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. a, but the anti-tax sensibilities—they they're moving some excise tax pieces in other states, so it's not 
you know, we're just about to finish our excise tax guide on how to do this. Not that it necessarily gives you the magic, the magic wand to make excise taxes increase in your state, but we we have found some interesting lessons learned from other states where we've done this. So, well, thank you. I appreciate uh -huh. I appreciate your your your, your comments on that. Um, does anybody else have their hand up, or should yeah, we move Sheila's on? Sheila's got her hand up. I'm going to unmute Sheila. Great. Hello. Hi, Sheila. Hi. I just had, um, I guess, kind of a comment and question. I just noticed uh, in the uh, gas station that you can buy a glass of wine. Really? It's in a pack. Wow. It's a glass of wine. I've never seen that. I wonder if anybody else has seen that in their, uh, in their areas. You can't drink it there, but you can buy it there. Is that correct? You can buy it there. It's wrapped, and it's in a little glass. It's yeah, that's a, that is a great example. It's like a glass of wine to go. Yeah. And I, I, <laughs> I, I, I guess I can. We can really understand how you tell people not to drink and drive, but you sell all this stuff at a gas station. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. You get in your car, you, you basically got to... <laughs> yeah. Is it, is it chill? You drink your wine. Yeah. So the, it's the white wine is chilled and yeah, no, okay. it's, not well, it's, it's on a little little uh, spindle. Interesting, really interesting. Yeah, I don't, I have not seen that before. So thank you. I'll be keeping my my eyes open for that. Okay, <laughs> amazing. And so also, Michael, uh, I can't raise my hand. I have two questions, and it looks like Beth <laughs> also chimed in. The do okay. medical marijuana just north of us in Michigan availability yes. and has gone up. Cost has come quite far down. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then I'm just wondering if you might just share, and, and maybe we could stick a pin in this for part two. But I, I'm wondering if you or someone else on the line uh, might have some quick tips on how coalitions could gather data on price. Yeah. Um, in an in an illegal market, the depends on the product you're talking about. So for marijuana in an illegal market, I just ask kids, what are you paying? <laughs> they'll tell you. You know, I mean, they'll tell you what their friends are paying. I mean, you get this, so it's not a formal, it's not a formal um, kind of survey, but it will give you cues to what an eighth is going for, a quarter is going for, you know, an ounce is going for. Law enforcement tends to track that. No, not really. Not in any kind of formal way. I might, at least that's been my experience. You can certainly ask police Police may know more about what the street level price of uh, OxyContin is. Like when when ten dollars was mentioned, you know that would be something I would expect the police to basically say. Or even you know an SRO in the school or a school counselor uh, could tell you about the, pre the street price of uh, pharmaceuticals and maybe even the street price of, of marijuana as well. But it's it's less. It's not like there's good archival data on this. You really have to go in and just ask around. And Angela did point out I had forgotten that OSAM, which is one of our state departments, um, basically doing focus groups and treatment centers, that they often are asking questions around pricing. So on our, oh, our department's website, um, there is some um, ever-changing data on what they're finding. That's a great reminder, Angela. Um, that will, yeah, of course, you. be statewide versus local for any kind of tracking of impact of change. Um, and maybe this will be a transition, my second question, to other things you're going to say. But other than addressing happy hours, um, how else can we on the local level impact price? Well, I think that the example of the wine and glass is a great example. Um, the airline bottles, the um, – so there's an interesting price relationship. One of the ways you address price is you, you reduce the number of alcohol outlets because competition breeds price reductions. You know, it breeds competition. They drop prices. They do on. So happy hours. Single sale bottles is one of the ways we deal with price, and in many states have the authority. And I'm not, I, can't, I, I always get confused about your funny preemption laws in, in Ohio. We'd have to look at this, but many communities have said no sales of single bottles of, of beer, for example. You have to buy a six pack. Um, that eliminates the convenience of just buying one for a buck fifty. Um, the uh, you know eliminating small bottles. A lot of communities have eliminated the airline bottles. Um, the glass, the wine in the glass, communities have dealt, dealt with that. So what you really do, in addition to the happy hour strategies, you begin to go after the smaller units. And, you know, you can't sell pints, for example, in convenience stores or whatever makes sense. But you go to looking at restrictions in what can be sold that is by definition cheap. And that can be done through local ordinance. Excellent. 
Well, in most in most states, and so that would be if if folks wanted information on that, we we look and make sure that you weren't um, restricted. But yes, every state's got this, their own bizarre rules. Was there one other question hand up, or should we move on? I think we're good to move on. Good. Okay. So the last P is place. This is a biggie. Um, we've got about a half hour, so I'm going to start. See if I can not talk so much. Um, there are, we think of three kinds of environments around place where stuff is sold, social environments like homes where they may be using it, parks, uh, beaches, uh, and these public environments. So social environments tend to be home, and I got ahead of myself, and public environments tend to be those places like parks and public lands, um, you know, the beaches that are publicly owned or whatever it may be. So we look at the kinds of high-risk uh, consumption in all three of these settings. And this is where a lot of the work at the local level is done. Um, first, when we talk about the number of outlets, uh, I don't spend a, a lot of time on this except to say there's a robust body of literature now to show that the uh, over-concentration or high dens density of outlets is linked to a number of community level problems from, and will, and just by virtue of the number can increase underage drinking and not just because they're buying it there. This is what we now are clear on. That just density by itself is, in, is a risk factor for un, the rates of underage drinking. Um, if they also happen to be bad outlets and selling, that's another factor. But the availability itself and by virtue of the number of outlets is a problem. Um, we're concerned about where young people are getting their alcohol in retail environments. And sometimes uh, they're stealing it. And sometimes stores know that they're stealing it. And this, by the way, is a drugstore. Um, and they know they're selling it, but even are stealing it. But even though they know they're stealing it, it's cheaper to let them take a six pack than it is to deal with the security around it. And so when you talk to managers about this, if they're honest with you, they will say, the cost of loot, our, our lost revenue around alcohol is less than what it would cost us to spend against it. So we just let it go, you know, without, with kids. And you're just thinking, OK, you know. They know how to stop this stuff. One of the ways they stop theft is not put it on the end caps next to the door. But that's frequently where you see it. Um, sales to minors. Uh, sales to minors is such an interesting, we've done a pretty good job with this over the years in this country. Uh, but the moment you take your eye off the ball, they tend to creep back up. One, young people know how to get this stuff. And eventually, unless there's a perception of risk on the part of the merchants of getting caught, then it begins to kick back up over time. Uh, shoulder tapping. Uh, give somebody five bucks, they go in and buy a beer, keep five, you know, give you a six pack of beer. That is an interesting phenomenon. In many communities, it's rampant. In other communities, it's, it's not, not a player at all. And so knowing, you know, from your end, knowing which of these is, you know, significant from the retail side is an important consideration. And sometimes that data is not readily available on your school survey. You have to, you have to dig in and, and, and talk to people, um, to, to young people in particular. Teen house parties, uh, you guys have done a lot around social host campaigns. Parents who host lose the most. Um, those who host lose the most. Big, big effort to try and deal with social host ordinances uh, to hold adults accountable. And the only detailed piece I'll say about this is that the laws that are showing to be most effective in local evaluations are those that are written with civil penalties as opposed to criminal penalties. It has to do with the burden of proof and staying out of the court system. Um, so once you move away from alcohol, then you start talking about where are people using drugs and buying and using their drugs. And there's lots of places that they get it. And when we start talking about this, you'll see in a few more slides that we also talk about the role of paraphernalia. And so para drug paraphernalia is an, interesting, is an interesting little piece of the whole drug scene. And, and in terms of the normative messaging it sends in your community about the role of drugs. But when we're thinking about this, we look at places like pain clinics. Now, I don't believe you have legal pain clinics, unless I'm mistaken, in Ohio. Um, uh, but I at least wanted to show you how an industry got its toehold in and began to develop an entire retail industry around this with dramatic, as you can see on the map, uh, expanded availability of these um, basically drug stores. Marijuana dispensaries, uh, California, Colorado being the two worst examples, where when the dispensary, when medical marijuana became legal, they proliferated like weeds, no pun intended. And in in San Francisco, at one point, there were more dispensaries than there were Starbucks, which was just 
you know, one of those fascinating sound bites that, that people looked at. So um, if and when medicinal marijuana comes to Ohio, uh, this is another topic, but for the, any of those of you who are at the CAD committee, or we're going to be having a session on how communities get ready for medical marijuana. What do you do? And there are things you can be doing now to essentially influence the impact it will take on your own community um, if it should become either legal, medical marijuana should be legal, or, or regular marijuana should be legal. Grow houses, I think, are a much bigger risk, frankly, than uh, dispensaries. The, you know, some preliminary research that we did in California interviewing growers um, in a couple of counties suggested that a grower indoors in a 10 by 10 foot square area, which is legal in this, these areas in California, uh, can grow 36 pounds of pot a year with, with grow lights and three crop cycles. They would sell maybe five pounds of that to a dispensary maybe a year. They, were, they had cards, medicinal marijuana cards, and they were there for patients, and they would smoke three to four pounds of pot a year a lot of pot, three, four pounds. Um, so between the selling of five pounds and the smoking of, let's give a benefit of the doubt, five pounds, which is way, way more than I mentioned. If you grow 36 and you only get rid of 10, you got 26 pounds of pot to do something with. And what they told us was they just sell it out the back door about half the price of what they sell at the dispensaries and you're still making a killing. So the availability of marijuana in your community may have less to do with dispensaries if you get medical marijuana and far more to do with the illegal growing or legal growing but illegal distribution out of those grow houses. And so one of the things that is when I was asking the question about where this stuff might be available in your community, it's going to be a lot of communities are beginning to dig down much more deeply now and find out what the whole grow scene is. And because it's so easy to grow and because there's hydroponics everywhere, um, increasingly people are growing it and then just moving it out of their back door. Um, uh, but in those places where we have uh, marijuana, a, a robust marijuana industry like California over a number of years, you can see what we get. You know, this is um, this is Santa Monica, California, uh, where you can you got walk-in, you got guys holding sandwich boards. I mean, it's just astounding. And every other store is a drug pair, a, a pair, of, you know, a head shop. Um, really, kind of an amazing scene that's that's built around that. It was true in Colorado as well. The states who are legalizing are trying to get their hands around that, but I think it's as I said earlier, it's going to be difficult. I'm wondering if you guys have drug paraphernalia in maybe not just in your liquor stores, but in your smoke shops and in other settings in your communities. Because I, my personal belief, and I have absolutely no data whatsoever to back this up, so I'm putting it as a belief, is that smoke shops that sell pipes and bongs and um, other forms of drug paraphernalia are the leading edge of a softening of the normative resistance to uh, legalized medicinal marijuana or regular marijuana. That as you allow head shops in, it, what the message it sends to the community is it's okay to sell this stuff and use this stuff. I mean, if there's no demand and you're not selling it and it's not in counters and people can't look at it, then then what's the point of selling it? And so you know there's demand. And basically allowing shops to sell the stuff to smoke it is fulfilling that demand at some level. It's not fulfilling the pot, but everybody knows the pot's there or the crack or whatever it may be, the methamphetamine. So I actually think that focusing on drug paraphernalia, whether it's in smoke shops or liquor stores or convenience stores or wherever it may be is a very powerful policy tool for communities that by itself isn't going to reduce use. I mean, you get all rid of all the pipes, it's not necessarily going to reduce use, but what it will do is so disrupt the status quo in your community and get people talking about whether or not we should be doing something about it. All right. Schools, surprising to me increasingly how much activity is happening in parking lots and in um, I was talking to a young woman who was on an airplane. <laughs> it's funny who you ended up talking to on airplanes, and she was asking me what I did, and I told her, and, and I always sort of don't want to tell people what I do. And she started telling me about the fact that she was in private school, uh, and uh, a third of her class had been been expelled for selling marijuana in the hallways. I said a third, and that was like 72 people, and it was just astounding. She said how in the last two years marijuana had become this not even underground product anymore. It's just sold everywhere in the parking lots, in the hallways, outside of school, just everywhere. And so getting their hands around, she knew where it was all sold. I mean, that's the value of these key informant interviews is she knew exactly where this stuff was, was being sold. Um, but it's an important piece to begin to understand. In, in my one of my CAD training two weeks ago, someone said that they, a young entrepreneur set up a very robust alcohol sales in the parking lot right after school. 
he had coolers out there and he would sell he would sell beer. People would drive by, they hand him the money, take the beer, and out they'd go. And finally they busted that up. But interesting to know this piece. With with foreclosed houses, rental properties now have become a pretty significant risk. Uh, if you have those for either using or selling or manufacturing or you know all of the above. Same with this notion of public spaces around parks and, and so on. And so from an environmental question, one of the big P's obviously is place. And what we really need to know is, and what you need to know really, is where is this stuff being used and sold? And that's, from our perspective, the core question that needs to be addressed um, as part of our coalition's efforts from an environmental perspective. And so the poll number four is what are the highest risk environments for underage drinking in your community? Parties, parks, fields, around schools, or something else? So we could open that poll. I have someone doing landscaping outside my house. Hopefully it's not too loud for you all. Home parties, yeah. So this is not surprising. Um, and those home parties are going to look different in different communities, and they're going to happen at different times. So getting your arms around what the home party environment looks like is going to be obviously a critical piece. And I know you have all, all have worked on a state social host ordinance. Um, we're finding it increasingly to be the case that the um, state laws are less effective than the local laws. Because one, they're not they're shaped as one law that may or may not take into account your local conditions. And most of the state laws tend to be criminally focused. So it's difficult to enforce them for a variety of reasons. So if you decide to go down the social host, I would certainly consider if you're not already uh, looking at um, uh, local ordinances that are focused on criminal sanction, uh, civil sanctions instead of criminal sanctions. All right. Michael, can so, I jump in real quick, Michael, I'm sorry. Um, for those sure. not familiar here in Ohio, our state law does have a very difficult knowledge standard for police to work from. And um, that is something we've already got some groundwork done here. You can always contact us if your coalition is um, looking at, at a, a localized social host law. In Ohio, you can have a law stronger than the state. And so know that we've got some groundwork, a sample ordinance that's consistent with Ohio law and some things you can work around. So you may want to make a note if you want to follow up here with Drug Fraction Alliance, we can help out with that. Great, great. Thank you. Um, I think we've been asking some questions. So I'm, unless, uh, let me stop. I just want to see, is there any, any questions before we move into the next couple of pieces, which I'm going to run through quite quickly uh, to get us through this? Anything at all. You can type them in the question box if you like. All right. Let me keep moving then. Um, so the real question here then becomes, how do you choose the right policy um, or the right environmental strategy uh, to address your local conditions? And essentially, you know, we think that really deeply understanding those four P's in your community will help set up what the right intervention is. Um, that in the absence of knowing about whether happy hours are a real contributor to high risk drinking or you know what's happening in your home parties environment or do you have too many alcohol outlets, are you selling to minors, do you have and whatever it looks like I think, then you know that sets up then the appropriate intervention. Uh, so we really encourage you to think in terms of the local, the way that it plays out, your four Ps play out locally, then to help set up the appropriate next intervention. And um, I'm interested in knowing very quickly, because we are running out of time, um, which of the following interventions are you familiar with? And so right now we just want to pick on the left column, compliance checks, retail server training, and this all deals with the retail side of the equation that we discussed uh, through the four Ps. Uh, Craig registration, price, or what we call land use tools, conditional use permits or deemed approved ordinances that are traditionally associated with reducing alcohol outlet density or um, those particular strategies. And you can pick as many as you like. Compliance checks. Good. 
retail server training. Okay. So there's, this is good to see because, frankly, the compliance checks are a far more powerful tool than are than is responsible beverage service. Responsible beverage service by itself has weak results. You get some results, but it's fairly weak unless it's coupled with um, compliance checks and unless it's mandatory for everybody in the community. So getting only some of the businesses to do RBS, uh, while that may be a good entry in uh, a good entry into the strategy, the ultimate goal, the science says, needs to be mandatory across all across the whole community. So that's helpful. Okay, good. So let's then move to the next um, next slide, and this looks on the social side, um, where we're looking at the around social availability, looking at legal risks for providing alcohol, i.e., shoulder tapping. Some people call that retail. Some people call it social access, we'll call it social. Uh, social host laws, uh, restriction on alcohol availability at community events or something else. Ooh, okay. Social host. Yeah, all right, good. So it looks like there's a lot of interest in that, and your points then, Allison, I think are really helpful. The fact that you've got a lot of templates, you've got campaign materials, you've got model ordinances, so the place to go for social host is clearly um, you know, to pick up the materials that have already been developed in state for you guys. Um, there are 10 steps connected to doing policy. And a lot of the strategies that we've talked about, mandatory responsible beverage service, man, you know, social host ordinances, restrictions on alcohol availability at public events, um, limiting the number of alcohol outlets, putting distance between them, stopping sales, you know, uh, changing school policies, are all policy related. They're policy, they're policy processes. And, and they may be organizational policies, which is what we tend to call small p, or they can be public policies, which we tend to call big p. But they have the same fundamental steps that are associated with them. And, um, and Allison, I want to sort of check in with you on timing here. There are two pieces left uh, that we have to cover. One is uh, this, these, these 10 policy steps, which I can kind of run through in the next 10 minutes. And then the, the, the next piece is the lobbying piece, the differences between lobbying and advocacy. I think I would propose that uh, we'll do what you think makes sense here, that we wrap the lobbying piece into part two and maybe just go through the policy advocacy now. Would that work for you? Uh, I agree with that. Um, it is something that we have covered at a number of our statewide prevention Great. coalition association meetings and uh, advocacy webinars. Not everybody may have participated on those, but uh, I think yep. you could streamline them the next time. Okay, good. Thank you. Because we'll be talking about some of the challenges around doing this work next time, and then the uh, questions about where do you cross over the line may be very germane at that point. So um, there's a way to do policy effectively. And, and it's not in the normal skill sets for most coalitions. Just need to say that right up front and acknowledge it, and it's, it's a learned skill, and it's not a learned skill that we've been trained in by and large. And, so, and it's also not a learned skill that most community members have been trained in by and large. So asking coalitions to do these environmental strategies that tend to have a policy focus in a way that has some, some systematic pr steps associated with it can help, but it does require a shift, again, all the way back to the beginning of the webinar, a shift in the perspective of your coalition who wants to have to want to do this stuff because it can get messy. And it's not a program, so you can't like open up a book and say, okay, on day one we're going to do this curriculum and on, you know, next week we're going to do this one. These 10 steps all have to happen, but they may happen in different sequences and they may, some of them may be going on simultaneously and, and so on. So what I'd like to do now is just introduce them to you. So selecting the interventions based on the four Ps is the what. What are you going to do? you know, local social host law, uh, mandatory responsible beverage service, you know, et cetera, et cetera. This is the how. This is how you actually get that done. And so the first step in this, and it's almost sounds too easy, is, you know, really stating the problem clearly. And the way you state a problem is you're very, very clear in very short number of words what your policy is, um, how it will improve the circumstance, and who your targets are. You know, who is it that gives you the power to pass it? And you'd be surprised how long it takes a coalition to come to consensus around that. Is it a mandatory RBS? Is it going to be all merchants? Or is it going to be some merchants? And who, well, who has the power to make them do that? And some folks will say, well, let's just go to the businesses. And they'll say, no, 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 we've got to go to the city council. Well, it's not the city council because we want to do this in the unincorporated area. So the real decision makers are the board supervisors. So that discussion is a rich one. And it needs to happen so everybody in your coalition understands the concept of decision makers 
having the power that you're trying to influence. That this first step begins to shift in the paradigm so that they understand, oh, we got to get to the Board of Supervisors for a countywide mandatory social host ordinance. And okay, that's, you know, now, now at least we know what we want to do. So we ask coalitions to develop what we call policy action statements. We encourage enforcement agencies for whatever policy you're looking at adopting to be involved early on in the development of the ordinance or development of the policy itself. So if it's the school, principal needs to be involved. If it's a, if it's a ordinance around um, um, a mandatory responsible beverage service, whoever's going to administer that needs to be involved. If it's an ordinance around social host ordinances, the cops need to be involved. And they have multiple roles. You can see those roles here. They can help you with data. They can help you describe the circumstances. They have a huge role in saying, yeah, we can do that, but we can't enforce that so that you can write the right pieces in there so it's really something they can do. And they can help you actually write the language. So law, putting law enforcement in early ensures back-end enforcement down line with any luck at all. Um, you need to have good data. You know, uh, if no matter which policy you select, You've got to show that you have a real problem and that that problem exists. And it's not only important to, have to describe this data so you can make a case to the community about why you're proposing this stuff, but more importantly that you have a legal foundation for whatever, your, whatever policy solution you're, you're going with. So you want to have really good data. And there's lots of different forms of data. And this is a place to go into how, what you look at, but there are qualitative in the sense of focus groups, key informant interviews, one-on-ones, uh, listening sessions. There's quantitative school surveys, community surveys, environmental scans, lots of different forms of data to help you describe which of your four Ps are in play and what they look like. And so collecting that data is very, very important. Making your case is equally important. And there's a way to talk about what you're going to do that is beyond just educating the community. This is really the beginning of shifting from doing social marketing, which is talking about the problem, to media advocacy, which is talking about the problem and the solution and doing a call to action simultaneously. So these things that we call issue briefs, or whatever you tool you use to sort of educate both the community and your decision makers, really is the first, for lack of a term, shot across the bow. Here's the problem. Here's what the science says works. Here's what we want to do. Get busy, community, and, and talk to your decision makers. Once you start saying, get busy, community, and talk to your decision makers, you're into lobbying, unless you're very thoughtful about it. And we'll talk more about that in, in, in three. I do not want to discourage you. Absolutely all of this can be done by coalitions if you're, if you're thoughtful about how you do it. So lots of different kinds of data, lots of different kinds of ways to talk about it. You have to write your policy. And the mistake that most coalitions make is they give it to the decision makers to write. We want to do a policy on mandatory responsible beverage service. City attorney, will you write it for us? Yeah, here's some examples. Now, you want to write your own policy. And then that's the, that's the place you begin negotiating. You uh, undoubtedly know that all politics is an art of negotiating. So whatever you start with in terms of your best case policy is going to get whittled down. If you start with something that a city, ma city manager or a city attorney has written, it's going to get whittled down already from a low place. So you go in with the coalition taking the time and energy to actually develop the policy that makes the most sense. How you do that, conversation for another day, but it's totally doable by a coalition. Media advocacy, um, we talked about the issue brief being the first stage, but the media advocacy becomes the, the turbocharge to your campaign. It allows you to frame your message about underage drinking and about social hosting the way you want as opposed to the opposition, whoever that is, saying, this is just an infringement on my rights. This is illegal by the Constitution. Kids are better off drinking at home than getting drunk there because at least they don't drive. You can imagine, and I'm sure I've heard all the arguments. When you frame your message, and you're doing your own media, and you have your own spokespeople, you're rebutting those arguments in the context of what you say, and so that they have nowhere to go. So framing is everything. And the art of media advocacy is how you do, how you work with media in a way that tells your story, and that's a call to action so that you're both informing about the problem and encouraging people to get active in solving it. The seventh step is the organizing. And the community organizing, I started by this by saying that your role in um, 
uh, as, a, as a coalition shifts from being an educator to a community organizer. And here's where we get into the detailed base building, where you're talking to a lot of people, you're meeting one-on-one -on -one with a lot of people, you're doing an analysis of your decision makers, who do they listen to, what are they likely to pay attention to, how do we influence them, what does the coalition need to do, how many people from the grassroots do we need to get to show power, how many people from the grass tops do we get, need to get in order to, have, to whisper in their ear. All of that process is the part of the power analysis, analyzing the power in the community, who holds it, and how, what's the self-interest of those who you have to in, influence. That's the, to me, this is the most exciting part of this work, is really doing that community organizing piece. But it's not a skill set that I think most coalitions have and, and many coordinators don't have. There's trainings on this stuff. There's trainings on all of these, but I'm just giving you the frame so you can understand all the, the core steps. Getting the policy adopted is, you know, is how do you go in front of the city or the school board or the Rotary Club board of directors or whoever it is where this thing's going to ultimately <clears throat> be discussed and heard and put your best for, foot forward and ensure that they can't, they can't say no. You know, I've seen far too many coalitions do the legwork, have conversations with the, say, city council for a social host ordinance, and they think they've got the votes, and they go in with five people, and the city council people look out in the audience, they see five people saying this is a good idea, and they change their mind because they don't think there's enough political will to support it. Um, so this piece around getting the policy adopted both sets up how you structure the actual hearing, but the steps that you need to lead up to to get that hearing to go your way so that after a year of work, it doesn't fall apart in one night. Ensuring enforcement policies are only good if they're put into practice. Price is a great one because you don't have to enforce it. Social host ordinances need to be you know, enforced. Mandatory RBS needs to be enforced. Compliance checks, all of these have some sort of an enforcement or implementation piece. And <clears throat> paying attention, when we, put, when we talk about a campaign like this, a policy campaign, say using social host, the first half of it is getting it adopted. The second half of it is getting it enforced and doing the public community work to ensure that the public then supports law enforcement enforcing it. And so the coalition has the, the law enforcement back when they're issuing citations and when these things are coming up and there's pushback on the community. I didn't know I was going to get a $500 ticket. Well, you know, coalition does an op-ed saying, thank you law enforcement for doing your job. You just saved this many lives or, you know, whatever it is kind of thing. So ensuring enforcement means really making sure that the police have the tools they need to enforce it or code or planning or whomever has the tools they need to enforce it. And, and I believe it's the coalition's job to make sure all those tools are in place. And then evaluating it has multiple pieces. It's both evaluating the policy passage, but it's also evaluating, it's not evaluating the, the impacts of the, of the policy yet. That takes time to see put into place. It's really evaluating your coalition's process in getting it passed. Did you follow the steps? Did you give away the ordinance at a time and lost control of it? Did you get everything you needed? Could you have done something differently? Did it blow up the coalition? Do you have to go back and rebuild? I mean, what happened? Because every policy action, every policy campaign should set up another one, should strengthen your coalition's capacity, the coalitions of the, res the capacity of the residents, coalition membership, in terms of its organizational membership, to do something more, as opposed to somehow deflating it to the point where people are, well, God, we don't want to do that again. So those are the steps. Um, and if you follow these steps, and if you do them well, and you do them comprehensively, and you don't flinch, nine out of 10 times, you'll win. Um, and if you have the legal authority to do it, obviously. There, there's an art to doing this work that is doable, and increasingly, coalitions across the country are putting, getting into the policy, policy work and um, finding it very, very uh, exciting and having successful results. So it is one minute till we end. This was the last slide before we moved into the advocacy and the lobbying. I can take, a, if there's any questions or any comments, I'm happy to take them as a last piece. Um, let me give you your homework real quickly uh, so that you know what it is we are asking you to do. I'm quickly running through these slides. OK, here's your homework. So I believe. And Allison said that the homework form, the template, was sent out ahead of time. It's probably sitting in your inbox somewhere. And it basically asks you 
to identify one or two of the risk factors we discussed, place, product, price, and promotion, that are in play in your community. Um, and maybe it's something that you want to work on, maybe it's something you've already worked on, maybe it's something you're planning to work on, but pick one and follow these five steps. What's the risk factor? Describe it a little bit in terms of what it looks like in your community. Well, we have 26 off-sale outlets and, uh, and 24 of them have advertising plastered in their window and delightful and we'd like to do something about it. Um, and if your coalition has identified a solution, a policy solution, tell me what it is. And if they haven't identified one, then you think and maybe sort of do some of that preliminary thinking because you may be in a position to introduce that to the coalition. What might be, having identified the risk factor, what might be an appropriate intervention um, uh, to, to, work, to, to address this? And I'm happy to, between now and the time when we get back on the phone at the end of the month, give you some recommendations. I'm sure Allison can help as well about what strategies do we know might be particularly useful um, in that regard. Um, what barriers did you experience if you've already done something or do you anticipate experiencing if you try to implement the policy? And if there are barriers either that you had or you're anticipating, what could be some of the possible solutions uh, to the challenges that you've identified? The goal of this homework is to have you, part of why we did this two-part piece is to, one, establish a foundation for what, what environmental strategies are, what are community risk factors, and to introduce this notion of you know, best practice interventions. And secondly, to try and see if we can't surface what are some of the challenges and issues that are preventing some coalitions from doing this kind of work. To see if we can't kind of jumpstart that a little more than it may already be in place. So that's the homework. Um, and when we get on the phone or on the webinar for the, at the end of the month, we'll be asking you to talk about these things and to sort of give some reports and we'll be dissecting them and talking about them. I'll be doing the lobbying piece to catch up from this one and then we'll go from there. Allison, anything you'd like to add? Uh, yes, I do have a few things to close things out. Uh, so uh, first and foremost, I of course would like to thank you, Michael, for such a great presentation and also thank everyone for participating in today's session. Just a